Thanks for finding Lighthouse Fellowship on YouTube. We're from Quincy, Massachusetts. My name is Mike Fian. I'm pastor here at the church, and I'm going to be preaching from Philemon, verse 17 through 25. So if you consider me, Paul, your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I'll repay it to say nothing of you owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me. I am hoping that through your prayers, I'll be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, as, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. In 1999, the Red Sox hosted the All-Star Game at Fenway Park. A good friend of mine who worked in the industry, so he gave me a pass, and I worked with him for, at Fox News for the night. So as I walked through the gate, and basically we wore the pass that he's with me, and so all the access my friend had gained, because he was in the industry, I too had gained. I shared with him according to his authority and his badge. And it's great to have that feeling, that they received me as they received him. So you got to go all over the park and up on Writer's Row and all these fun places I had never been before, and I always liked Fenway Park. But the letter we're reading here tonight has a similar feel to it. It says, receive him as you receive me, the Apostle Paul said. Apostle, the Apostle Paul had a friendship with this guy named Philemon. They had a beautiful partnership in the gospel. It says, if you consider me your partner, in verse 17, it says, receive him as you receive me. The Apostle Paul was trying to build a friendship, trying to restore a friendship between two men. He says, Philemon, as we are buddies in the gospel, you're to treat him the same way. He's a buddy. He's a, he's a child of God. And the word for partner is koinonia, and it has something to do with spiritual friendship. It's a sharing in the gospel. And anyone who's in the church who belongs to Jesus Christ has this friendship. And even that's one of the things, you come to faith in Christ and you join the church, you recognize that people are pretty friendly and you're included based on your relationship with God through Christ. So you're family. In the church, you're not only to love one another, you're to like one another. And not, you're not just to tolerate, but you're to love. And, and Paul was trying to say this to Philemon. Philemon, if you consider me a brother, yes you do, then treat me with the same attitude. Treat him that way. And it's pretty straightforward in the church. We should just get along. And it's easy for the most part, unless it's not. I mean, some, some relationships have a history. And when I think of a history, it reminds me of my wife. One day we were in the, in the neighborhood and she met this, these two people and she didn't seem to think they knew each other. So we're chatting away, we knew this woman from this street and this guy from that street. And they're pretty quiet and maybe not awkward. So Beth stops and she says, oh, hey, do you know so-and-so? And this guy, We'll call him Joe. Joe goes, yes, we went to the prom together. <laughs> it was the funniest thing because we thought they were total strangers. They were being kind of quiet toward one another, but it turns out they had a history, and they had a good history. They, they were friends for a long time, and we just didn't know it. But sometimes in the church, yeah, the history isn't that good. And that's the letter we have here today. The, the history between these two, there was conflict in it. In it. You see, the, the setting is um, one where this man Onesimus is a runaway slave, and he he ran from his owner, Philemon. Philemon's the, the man who Paul writes to in the letter. So Onesimus ran from Philemon and he's done some wrong to Philemon, possibly stolen from him. So this is runaway slave, during his travels, finds himself in front of the Apostle Paul, who's in jail. Apostle Paul shares the gospel and Onesimus comes to faith. He's a changed man. And through some collaboration, and none of these details are shared, Onesimus ends up coming back to Philemon. In fact, he's, we think he's standing right in front of him reading this letter that Paul's written, this letter to Philemon that we're reading here today. And he's presenting it to Philemon to make, break bread, to, to, to restore the friendship. And so the letter establishes the fact that you are now brothers. So if you consider me, Paul says, if you consider me a partner, consider him one. So he's your brother. But we find out in verse 18 that he's also, there's a history, and it's a bad history. They, they wronged one another. Well, Philemon has actually been wronged by Onesimus, and it's complicated, but 
we can at least say for this that Onesimus has done something wrong and he's come home to, to make amends, to stand up and to accept his, his role. And, the, and it's up to Philemon to work his way through it. He's wronged you. And in Christianity, it's, Christianity never entitles a person to default in their debts. Restit restitution in Christianity is biblical. And so for Philemon, who's, who feels himself to be wronged, according to Numbers in chapter 5, it would be repay what you wronged and add 20% to it, or a fifth. So what about Onesimus? Um, Onesimus is a new man. He's come to faith in Christ. He's back, and he's, he's repentant. He's returned to his master to make things right. He's, here, he's no doubt to accept personal responsibility for all that he's done. And that reminds me of a, of a, of a story in the New Testament where a man Zacchaeus comes to faith in Christ, and it just tells that Zacchaeus met Christ. And Zacchaeus was a man who was a chief tax collector, and he stole, and he defrauded people, and he's a crooked man. He's rich, though. But after his encounter with Christ, it says that he gave half his money to the poor, and to anyone he defrauded, he gave back fourfold. Zacchaeus knew salvation, knew Christ calls it that today that he has found salvation. Zacchaeus' new faith has expressed itself in great generosity. So what's, what's the situation here? What, sh what shall happen? Well, Onesimus should pay back, but part of, the, part of the problem here is what if he can't, I think? I think that's what the scripture is saying. What if he can't pay back? Well, that obstacle in this relationship needs to be removed. So in order for Philemon to receive Onesimus, someone, somehow this offense has to be removed. So if Onesimus can't do it, what's going to happen? It's going to block rock reconciliation, possibly be. But verse 18, Paul chimes in and says, If, I, if he, your, Onesimus, has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge it to my account. Paul writes this with his own hand. He says, I will repay it. Paul is taking a debt for that which is not his own. He's taking responsibility for another man's problem. It's a great picture. Years ago, a friend tells me he was manager of a site and he hired a young, a young man we call Joe. And Joe tried to do a great job and he was, he was earning money for school and it was an important job. And so Joe was working on the site one day and he, he made a mistake. And when they turned on the equipment, they made a big mess. While the manager had a tr tremendously difficult relationship as it was, the production wasn't going well. And that mess made it much worse and there were accusations. And so it was a decision to make. The manager ended up not implicating Joe and protected him. He accepted all the blame and he affirmed his client that he would, it was his fault. That he could retain, retain, retrain Joe and the responsibility was his. And Joe kept his job and was able to make money. But the manager lost some respect in the eyes of his client. But he didn't lose his job, but it was very difficult. You wonder why that happened. Well, that manager would tell you that 2,000 years ago, someone took responsibility for something that was his responsibility, and it forever changed him. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ took responsibility for us on the cross. He took our debts on the cross, something that wasn't his responsibility. He took him to the cross in forgiveness. And that gospel of grace changes us. And that's possibly, that's the motivation Paul has here. Paul says, whatever he's wronged, Charge it to my account. That's a picture of the gospel. In fact, the God, this letter finally even doesn't mention the death and the resurrection of Christ, but it is a beautiful picture of it right here. Paul's living out, he's portraying the gospel here for us and showing it what's it look like. That he's going to make reconciliation between two parties by taking responsibility for that which is not his own. For Jesus Christ did that very thing. Man, us, who's living at odds with God, estranged, at war with God, due to our sin, original sin, estranged from the Father, out of fellowship, a poor relationship with God, Jesus Christ takes our sins to the cross so that we would be reconciled to the Father. That's the great truth of the gospel. That's what we see here in Paul, and it's powerful. And Paul takes it further. He's going to remove the obstacle, but he's also going to reveal the truth of the dead. And he's going to help this man... Philemon, get unstuck. And at times we can look at our debts and how others have wronged us and it gets us so angry and we, and we have trouble forgiving. 
And we need to see it in light of the gospel, in the light of the truth of reality. And Paul writes it here in his little, little statement here in the end of the verse, to say nothing of you owing me your very own life. See, Paul has, been, Paul has led Philemon to faith also. You owe me the new life you have in Christ. And Paul's just expressing the fact that God used me to bring you to faith. So when it comes to debts, consider the debts properly. Onesimus owes you a material debt. Oh, you owe me a spiritual debt. Onesimus owes you a temporal debt. Finally, I mean, it's temporary, but you owe me, finally, I mean, you owe me the, an eternal debt. It's important for us to, to get unstuck, is to th see things clearly, and I believe Paul's helping us see things clearly. This debt isn't as significant as you think it is, and it's good for us to consider those who we are indebted to. Who are the people in your life that have shared faith with you, have, have led you, and have just walked with you, even when you're unlovable and short-sighted and hung up on things? And who's paid a debt, possibly, paid money to free you from a stuck situation and get on with your life? Who are these people? Your parents? Or your Sunday school teacher? Or maybe your neighbor? Invited you to church? Shared the gospel with you? We're indebted to those people. They've done great things. Small group leader, whomever it may be, a person at school, a person in your dorm possibly. You came to faith and wow. It's probably a good exercise to, to think about that and fill your heart and your mind with that and allow that to occupy all the space that small debts and aggravations and unforgiveness can occupy. See things rightly. Don't be filled up with all this negativity, but see how God has blessed you through other people. Those you are indebted to, write a letter, share an email. Encourage them. Tell them you love them and thank them for it. Celebrate what God has done and don't be stuck in these little debts. Philemon has been wronged, but he needs to concentrate and consider the fact how he has been blessed and how he's indebted to Paul, what Paul has done. And Paul says, put it on my account, but don't expect me to pay it finally. I mean, look at it. Really? It should be forgiven. See, Paul, Paul is helping his buddy finally I mean, to get past this. He's helping these two men to come together and to have friendship. See, it's refreshing. Paul says, yes, brother, I want to benefit from you on the Lord and Refresh my heart in Christ. Early in the letter of Philemon, we know that Philemon is a man who is refreshing many. His house is an oasis in Colossae. He has a house church and people come there with heavy hearts and he fills them with the gospel and with Jesus Christ. And their life is changed and they're encouraged in their ministry and serving Jesus. And that this is a great blessing for him in the middle of the city. And Paul says, I want you to refresh my heart also in this instance. I want you to consider this debt and let it go. I want you to bring yourself together. You see, forgiveness takes one person, but reconciliation takes two. And Paul's working toward having a man soften his heart toward the situation. And to refresh our heart is exactly what we need in this world, because reconciliation, forgiveness, peace, and harmony is what we need. Because this heart, this world, we, we live in a world of, uh, of rights, our rights, and not trespassing on our rights or our property. We live in a world of offenses. I'm offended, you're offended, that's offensive and threatening, and we live in a world of conflict. We just have plenty of examples in that stuff, and it gets tiring, and it sucks the energy out of us. You know what's refreshing? People being obedient to Christ. They let God's word sink in their hearts. They're soft toward God, and they're soft toward other people. What's well, obedient is loving. People loving one another is refreshing and forgiveness, and reconciliation. Two parties coming together that were, that were at war, at, at odds. That's beautiful. That's what this world needs to see. And that's what Paul says, refresh my heart. Refresh the church. When I, when I joined a church at one point in my life, and, uh, after I got married, and I, when I came there, I met two fabulous people. And I got to know them, and I really appreciated them both, and they got along so well, everyone did in the church, and it was great. And after time, I found out that they were once married and divorced. And it sunk in, I'm like, they love each other and respect one another. And they're caring. I never would have known they had a history of conflict. But it was a picture of reconciliation. I tell you, it just was, a sh it just seemed so right. We should see that in the church. 
We should see that in the church. Paul continues to write, you know, confident of your obedience that he knows Philemon is a man of character. He's going to wrestle through this situation. He's going to do even more than Paul asks. And we don't know what that is, but it's great to wonder what that looks like. Maybe he sends this servant Onesimus back to Paul in jail so he can help him some more because Onesimus was at one point helping out Paul in jail. And maybe he does that. Who knows? But they say he will do more. But also there's a little point of accountability here. It says, at the same time, I know you're praying for me. Prepare a guest room for me, Philemon, because I'm going to come visit you and, and pray that I'll be graciously released and given to you. So he's asking Philemon, Philemon, continue in your prayers that I'm let out of jail, because when I'm let out of jail, I'm going to come to you. When I come to you, Philemon, I'm going to enjoy seeing this beautiful picture of reconciliation. I'm going to enjoy seeing how you love Onesimus like you love me. I'm going to just enjoy the fact that this once slave is now a brother, and that whole slave and master relationship is just gone. Paul is just looking forward to that day and asking Philemon to pray for that day. And he's saying, Philemon, you're accountable. Make this happen. He's writing this letter to the whole church. In front of everyone, show everyone what reconciliation looks like when this worked out practically. And we see at the end, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And Paul writes this the same way he wrote at the beginning of the letter. And it's the fact that God's grace, his unmerited, unearned favor towards sinners, towards people like us, leads to transformation. It leads to broken relationships becoming deep friendships. It leads to two people at war becoming friendship friendly and loving toward one another. In this letter, there are so many encouraging lessons for us. We should just be encouraged that we're to receive one another as we receive our good friends. We're to love richly in the church and, and care for one another. The church is no place for toleration. The church is a place for loving, for openness, and for kindness, and for liking people. And this letter also encourages us to consider, consider others' debts properly. Consider the small stuff in life and consider the big stuff in life. If there are people that are indebted to us, they've done some, some wrong, but there are many that we are indebted to. There are many in our lives that have blessed us and gone the extra mile toward us. Don't get stuck in those little debts that others owe you. Consider the debt we owe others. Consider the good and godly people that, that, that are in our lives, that, that care for us, that that take responsibility for things that we didn't, that they don't need to. And consider the one who's taken responsibility for your very life and went to a Roman cross. For the power of this all is grace. And Jesus Christ paid it all, as the song says. Jesus paid it all and, and all to him I owe you, I owe. That's just so powerful and simple. Reconciliation is brought by Jesus Christ. We are now one with the Father in his family because Jesus Christ intervened. He took something that didn't, wasn't his problem, wasn't his responsibility, our sin. He lived a perfect life, but he took our sin and paid for it so that we could be reconciled to the Father as we should be, as it was in the beginning. That's the power of the gospel. That's the power of what's behind this letter here. May we go forth receiving and loving reconciliation so much that we are advocates for reconcilia reconciliation everywhere we go. May we be willing, if opportunity presents itself, to take responsibility for things that aren't ours so that we can see two people come together and be reconciled. May the, the hope of the gospel be in us. Amen.